Okay, let's uh, let's go to Joshua, chapter nine. The uh, the first two verses are now it came about when all the kings who were beyond the Jordan, in the hill country and in the low land and on all the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard of it that they gathered themselves together with one accord to fight with Joshua and with Israel. Now, there's, there's a unified opposition here that's gathering against Israel. In chapter 10, coming up uh, here in just a little bit, Israel fights against a southern coalition. And then in chapter 11, they're going to fight against a northern coalition. Now, Gibeon is an alliance of four cities who did not wish to fight Israel. Verse 3, when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho at Ayah, or into Ayah, they also acted craftily and set out as envoys, and took worn out sacks on their donkeys and wineskins, worn out and torn and mended, and worn out and patched sandals on their feet, and worn out clothes on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and had become crumbled. Now, Gibeon, the head of an alliance of four Hivite cities, preferred peace rather than to be t- destroyed. Um, they did survive. Now, El Jeb, which is uh, an ancient, which is ancient Gibeon, furnishes archaeological evidence of continuous occupation from the time of the Exodus to the fall of Jerusalem, and no full destruction layer was really shown in their uh, excavations. Now, evidence also indicates that winemaking was a major occupation with these people, and that's what we see here. <clears throat> Verse 6, And they went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal, and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now therefore make a covenant with us. And the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you are living within our land. How then shall we make a covenant with you? But they said to Joshua, We are your servants. Then Joshua said to them, Who are you and where do you come from? And they said to him, Your servants have come from a very far country. Because of the fame of Yahweh, your Elohim, for we have heard the report of him and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. <clears throat> now, they said they heard of Elohim and all the, uh, all the things he did for Israel and Egypt, and they also mentioned things that he did, the people he conquered on the other side of the Jordan. Okay? Now, they did not mention their recent victories because they're from afar off, remember? They wouldn't have heard that yet. That's what they're they're trying to portray here. They put on some old clothes, they had old wineskins, everything's torn. We've traveled a long way. And we just want to be your friends. We want to be your servants. They want them to think that they're from a long way away. In verse 11, so our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions in your hand for the journey, and go to meet them, and say to them, We're your servants. Now then, make a covenant with us. This, is, uh, this our bread was warm when we took it for our provisions out of our house, houses on the day that we left to come to you, but now, behold, it's dry and has become crumbled. <coughs> and th- these wineskins which we filled were new, and behold, they're torn, and these are clothes and are... Sandals are worn out because of the very long journey. <clears throat> well, here's the thing. They're very clever here in their deception. They were eager to make a covenant with Israel. Israel was very easily tricked. You know why? Because they didn't inquire of Elohim. They didn't ask him, what's up? Who are these folks? What should we do? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Just make a decision. Right? So, that was the thing. That Joshua could approach Elohim and get answers, but they didn't do it. Verses 14 and 15, So the men of Israel took some of their provisions and did not ask for the counsel of Yahweh. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore an oath to them. So they made a covenant that they would live in peace with these people and not destroy them. 
And their sin here is not asking for the counsel of Elohim. Verse 16. And it came about at the end of three days after they made a covenant with them that they heard that they were neighbors and that they were living within their land. Then the sons of Israel set out and came to their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon and uh, Kephira and Beeroth and kiriath Jerim. And the sons of Israel did not strike them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, and the whole congregation grumbled against the leaders. <clears throat> Here's the deal. You make a covenant, you have to follow it. They were even deceived in this covenant. Okay? But they made the covenant. They have to follow it. And that's the importance of a covenant that's made. Remember uh, Elohim said, I hate divorce. That's the breaking of a covenant. Can't do it. Yeah. They didn't have anything to break. They, were, they became the servants of Israel. And remember the command going into the land? Destroy them all. Do not make covenants with them. Okay? Well, yeah, but they lied to us about where they were from. Shouldn't that, shouldn't that do away with the covenant? <clears throat> well, um, you know what? Their end of the bargain was to become uh, servants. And they did that. It doesn't, does, uh, you know, if they're living up to their end of it, what can you say? I mean, you lied to us before that. Well, that wasn't in the covenant. You have to, if you make a covenant, you have to do it. You know, Tom, this kind of fits in with what you were saying. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to make everything I say a covenant. But treat it as such. Treat it as such. Everything you say. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's very important. Now, many years later, Saul, he was that first king of Israel. Remember him? He broke this covenant. And you know what happened? All of Israel paid dearly with a famine. It's in 2 Samuel 21, verse 1. It says, Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David sought the presence of Yahweh, and Yahweh said to him, It is for Saul and his bloody house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. Oops. That was a long time later. That was a long, long time later. Okay, we're talking six, seven hundred years later. At least five hundred. You make a covenant, you have to keep it. Versus, and see, this is even against, even more important than keeping what he said to do. Because he said to destroy all those people. Well, you keeping that covenant is more important, believe it or not. You got to keep that covenant. <clears throat> It's covenants. Why you circumcise? If you're going to circumcise a little boy on the eighth day and it's a Sabbath, you uh, you go ahead and do it because that's the making of a covenant. That's being a part of the of the covenant with Elohim. Verses 19 and 20. But all the leaders said to the whole congregation, "We sworn to them by Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel. Now we cannot touch them. This we will do to them. Even let them live, lest wrath be upon us for the oath which we swore to them." Well, the Gibeonites were allowed to live because of the oath. And we read in Numbers 30, verse 2, If a man makes a vow to Yahweh, or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. See, that's part of the Torah, too. That's part of the Torah. That's binding yourself. You bind yourself to an obligation, you do it. Okay, people don't believe that nowadays, and that's a, that's, it's rare that people do that on a consistent basis. Let's, let's be among the, the, let's be on the good side of this. Say to do it, you know, <clears throat> maybe that's kind of my problem at times. It's better not to say too much. 
you know, the less you say, oftentimes, the better. That way you obligate yourself a lot less. Verse 21 of Joshua 9, And the leaders said to them, Let them live. So they became hewers of wood and drawers of water for the whole congregation, just as the leaders had spoken to them. Then Joshua called for them and spoke to them, saying, Why have you deceived us, saying, We're very far from you when you're living within our land? Now therefore you're cursed. You shall never cease being slaves, both hewers and of wood and drawers of water, for the house of my Elohim. <clears throat> the Gibeonites were placed in an environment where they will be exposed to a knowledge of Elohim. Now Elohim's judgment in this case was an act of grace that brought many into a relationship with him. For instance, the prophet by the name of Hananiah was from Gibeon. In Jeremiah 28, verse 1, we read, Now it came about in the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of Yahweh in the presence of the prophets and all the people. So, <clears throat> some good did come out of that. Verse 24 of Joshua 9, And they answered Joshua and said, Because it was certainly told your servants that Yahweh your Elohim had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land before you. Therefore we feared greatly for our lives because of you and have done this thing. And now behold, we're in your hands. Do as it seems good and right in your sight to do to us. Thus he did to them and delivered them from the hands of the sons of Israel, and they did not kill them. You know, the people seemed to fear Elohim, and they were willing to submit to whatever terms were given. It was a total surrender on their part. <clears throat> but that wasn't supposed to be an option for anyone within that land. Verse 27, But Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of Yahweh to this day in the place which you would choose. Well, the Gibeonites were spared, and many of them became part of Israel in years to come. Uh, this did cause problems, though, in later years. But it's only because of Israel misunderstanding and their disobedience that this happened. And Elohim can work despite our failures, and he does. <clears throat> let's... Uh, Let's look at chapter 10. First two verses. Now it came about when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured a, captured a Yah and had utterly destroyed it, just as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to a Yah and its king, and that the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were within their land that, they, that he feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, because it was greater than a yah, and all of its men were mighty. <clears throat> now, the king of Jerusalem, he was very afraid. Gibeon, in that day, was a great city. And it was a lot bigger and a lot, um, a lot more fierce than a yah. But they surrendered themselves as slaves to Israel. <clears throat> so, verse 3, therefore, Adonai Zedek... What does Zedek mean in Hebrew? King. That's right. That's right. Uh, have you noticed I, I was corrected one day on saying Melchizedek? It's Melchizedek. So, anyway. <clears throat> Therefore, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent word to Hoham, king of Hebron, and Piram, king of Jarmuth, and Jophia, king of Lachish, and to Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the sons of Israel. And so the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered together and went up, and they with all their camps or armies camped by Gibeon and fought against it. See, these, uh, this, this coalition here of, of uh, armies, they are, they're really not happy with Gibeon for giving up like this and surrendering. 
They thought they could all stick together and defeat Israel. And here, uh, just a little map as, as to what happened here. <clears throat> uh, Gibeon there was, uh, in red, you see the Canaanites going after Gibeon, and Israel is going to go to Gibeon and fight this coalition. Verse 6, then the men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that live in the hill country have assembled against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the valiant warriors. And Yahweh said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not one of them shall stand before you. Uh, Yahweh told Joshua, he said, I'm giving them into your hands. Uh, you have nothing to fear. And we don't even hear about them losing hardly any people when they go into these, uh, into these battles with Elohim in control. Verses 9 and 10. So Joshua came upon them suddenly by marching all night from Gilgal. <coughs> and Yahweh confounded them before Israel. And he slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and pursued them by the way of the ascent of Beth Haran, and struck them as far as Azekah and Makeda. So they marched all night from Gilgal to help the people of Gibeon. And many of the opposing forces died there. And they chased them some 20 miles <clears throat> or so to Azekah and Makeda, and that's, that's these cities in the black right here. Verse 11, it came about as they fled before, from before Israel while they were at the descent of Beth Haran that Yahweh threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Ezekiah and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than those whom the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Now, this is uh, that's very interesting. I, I like, did you notice that the, the armies got confused? The coalition got real confused, okay? And then in their retreat, Elohim threw hailstones or stones down on them. And, you know, we read about that when Yeshua returns, it's going to be very similar. He's going to do the same thing again. It's going to be on a bigger scale, but it's going to be very similar. We read in Revelation 16, starting at verse 19, And the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And Babylon the Great was remembered before Elohim to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men. And men blasphemed Elohim because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. <clears throat> yeah. You know, yeah, we talked about how the destruction of Jericho was a picture of the return of Messiah, too. Remember, it's going to be the sound of a trumpet and a shout. Same type thing. And that's what we're seeing here, too, is uh, something very similar. Verses 12 and 13. Then Joshua spoke to Yahweh in the day when Yahweh delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of, of Aegelon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. Now, Joshua's description here, it's an accurate one. He commanded the sun and the moon to stay in place relative to the earth. This is, uh, it's obviously some kind of a miracle. Can't be explained naturally. Um, have you ever heard this, uh, that NASA tracked a missing day in history. NASA tracked a missing day in history due to star formations and whatnot. Uh, yeah, well, don't. It's an urban legend. It's wrong. It's, it's more poo-poo on the Internet, okay? <laughs> so don't let, it, don't let it fool you. <clears throat> Verse 14, and there was no day like, uh, like that before it or after when Yahweh listened to the voice of a man and Yahweh fought for Israel. Never been a day like this one. 
Yahweh heeded the voice of a man. You know, the, the, uh, we're told in James the prayer of a righteous man avails a lot. Well, if it can stop the sun and the moon, that's a lot. That's a lot. It's Joshua's actions and obedience that spurred this reaction from Elohim. Joshua did not hesitate to obey that covenant he made with Gibeon, and that's what he had to do. That pleased Elohim and made Israel victorious in a miraculous way. Verse 15, then Joshua and all Israel with him returned to the camp at Gilgal. Now these five kings had fled and hidden themselves in the cave at, at Makeda. And it was told Joshua, saying, the five kings which had been found hidden in the cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, roll star, large stones against the mouth of the cave and assign, and assign men by it to guard them. Okay, so these five kings are captured in the cave, and they're going to be dealt with a little bit later. Verse 19, but do not stay there yourselves. Pursue your enemies and attack them in the rear. Do not allow them to enter their cities, for Yahweh your Elohim has delivered them into your hand. And it came about when Joshua and the sons of Israel had finished slaying them with a very great slaughter until they were destroyed, and the survivors who remained of them had entered the fortified cities. <coughs> Excuse me, that all the people returned to the camp at, to Joshua and Makeda in peace. No one uttered a word against any of the sons of Israel. Israel pursued those enemies. They destroyed them. Some of them entered fortified cities, but no one said anything against the people of Israel. Verse 22, then Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring these five kings out to me from the cave. <coughs> and they did so and brought these five kings out to him from the cave. The king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came about that they brought these five kings out to Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, Come near, put your feet on the neck, necks of these kings. <coughs> Excuse me. So they came near and put their feet on their necks. Now these guys were probably bound, okay, tied up in shackles in, in some way. They're forced down to the ground. And he, Joshua said for the men of Israel to come forward, Put your feet on the necks of these kings. Joshua then said to them, Do not fear or be dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for thus Yahweh will do to all your enemies with whom you fight. So afterward Joshua struck them and put them to death. And he hanged them on five trees, and they hung on the trees until evening. <clears throat> so their, their bodies, they were, their body, they were uh, killed and their bodies were hung in trees, five different trees. Now according to the law, according to the Torah, they had to be taken down before evening. If you do that. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23, And if a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he's put to death, and you hang him on a tree, now why would you hang him on a tree? If you did something worthy of death, why would you do that? That's right. That's the message to everybody. His corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day, for he who is hanged is accursed of Elohim so that you do not defile your land which Yahweh your Elohim gives you as an inheritance. And this is illustrative of the curse Yeshua bore for the sins of, of his people. This passage and others are indicative that he was uh, nailed to a cross member and put up on a tree, hung on a tree. And we get that from a lot of scriptures, actually. Galatians 3, verse 13 says... Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. <clears throat> and in 1 Peter 2, verse 24, we read, He who he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Now, that Greek word for tree is... Uh, Xulon. Now, it's, it's, it refers to any kind of wood, really, but it doesn't refer to a, a cross, as we say, but that's how it's translated often, is that cross thing. <clears throat> and that's the big Christian symbol. Um, 
is that that T. Um, and we've talked about it before. You know where the T came from? Yeah, that's a Tammuz thing. Um, it's pretty sad that I, I don't know. You can, Christians they they try they they have a, a strong reverence for that cross thing, but it really has nothing to do with Yeshua at all. He wasn't hung, hung on a, a small letter T. Okay, it was uh, it was just a cross member, a beam that was apparently put into a tree. That same word, Zulon, it's used in other places in Scripture. Look at Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the Zulon, tree of life, and may enter into the, uh, by the gates into the city. See, that, <clears throat> that whole cross thing, uh, there'd be only one reason that I could think of to actually have one. And that's if there's a vampire after you and he's right about to bite your neck and you can hold that thing up and he'll, he'll hiss and then run away. You know, uh, why that works, I have no idea. Maybe he's afraid of Tammuz. That would be my guess. What do you think? Yeah, I guess we could just use garlic. So, as if the vampire thing's a problem, just use garlic. Don't worry about that too. Yeah. I know. Scripture says no images. Sure. That's that's correct. That's correct. There's nothing that can be symbolic of the Father, <clears throat> because He created it all and. And he's greater than his creation, and yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a golden calf. It's kind of like a, a mediator thing to people, uh, you know. And then Catholicism, it has the, you know, the difference between a cross and a crucifix. Crucifix has Jesus on it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, back to Joshua. Verses 27 and 28. It came about at sunset that Joshua commanded, and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave where they had hidden themselves and put large stones over the mouth of the cave to this very day. Now, Joshua captured Makeda on that day and struck it and its king with the edge of the sword. He utterly destroyed it and every person who was in it. He left no survivor. Thus he did to the king of Makeda, just as he had done to the king of Jericho. So these kings were buried in the cave and stones were put back in the mouth of the cave. <clears throat> Verses 29 and 30, Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Makeda to Libna and fought against Libna. And Yahweh gave it also with its king into the hands of Israel. And he struck it and every person who was in it with the edge of the sword. He left no survivor in it. Thus he did to its king, just as he had done to the king of Jericho. See, the army didn't rest for very long. Notice that? They're on a mission here. <clears throat> they had uh, they'd gone, they'd gone here to Makeda, then they're going to Libna. They still have some other places they're going to go here in this southern, uh, southern part of the land. Verses 31 and 32, And Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Libna to Lachish, and they camped by it and fought against it. And Yahweh gave Lachish into the hands of Israel, and he captured it on the second day and struck it, and every person who was in it with the edge of the sword, according to all that he had done to Libna. Lachish was delivered into Israel's hands also. They were, they were a strong city. It took two days. So... Uh, you can see the, the path they're taking. They came down here to Lachish. It looks like it's on to Eglon next. Verse 33, Then Horam king of Gezer came up to help Lachish, and Joshua defeated him and his people until he had left him no survivor. So, king of Gezer. 
thought he could help Lachish. It was a fatal mistake. Verses 34 and 35, And Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Lachish to Eglon, and they camped by it and fought against it. And they captured it on that day and struck it with the edge of the sword. And he utterly destroyed that day every person who was in it, according to all that he had done to Lachish. Israel went on to Eglon, and they uh, defeated Eglon. It was just within a day. They, uh, they, they had their running shoes on. <clears throat> These cities are not located right next to each other. Verses 36 and 37, Then Joshua and all Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron, and they fought against it, and they captured it, and struck it and its king, and all its cities, and all the persons who were in it with the edge of the sword. He left no survivor according to all that he had done to Eglon, and he utterly destroyed it and every person who was in it. So Israel fought Hebron and, and defeated them in very short order. Do we see a habit here? <clears throat> um, looks like they're going to Debir now, verse, uh, verses 38 and 39. Then Joshua and all Israel with him returned to Debir, and they fought against it. And he captured it and its king and all its cities, and they struck them with the edge of the sword and utterly destroyed every person who was in it. He left no survivor just as he had done to Hebron, and so he did to Debir and its king, so we had done to Libna and its king. <clears throat> so Israel fought Debir, conquered him, killed the king, killed all the inhabitants. And that looks like the end of the trail for now. Verse 40, Thus Joshua struck all the land, the hill country, and the Negev, and the lowland, and the slopes, and all their kings. He left no survivor, but he utterly destroyed all who breathed, just as Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, had commanded. All the people of the land were conquered. They were destroyed by Israel. This was prophesied in Deuteronomy 7, verse 24. And he'll deliver their kings into your hands so that you shall make their name perish from under heaven. So man will be able to stand before you until you have destroyed them. You haven't heard of the king of Gezer since then, have you? He's gone. Verse 41, and Joshua struck them from Kadesh Barnea, even as far as Gaza, and all the country of Goshen, even as far as Gibeon. And Joshua captured all these kings in their lands at one time, because Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, fought for Israel. So Joshua and all Israel with him returned to the camp at Gilgal. So they, came, they uh, conquered all the people in the south, and then returned to Gilgal. There was more fighting to be done. We'll get to the northern part of the land next week. Any questions? By foot. That you are exactly right. Um, exactly. Now, if you look at the map here, and that's a good point, uh, Cliff. I'm glad you brought that up. If you look at where they went from from Gilgal to Gibeon, well, you're going from sea level here to 2,000 feet in elevation, okay? And then fight when you get there. Uh, this is, uh, you see, and then, you know, you're going down here, the, you're crossing streams, you're, you're going back down to, you know, near sea level, and then uh, going back up the mountains again. Oh, 3,000 feet here. To Hebron. That makes a difference. That really will take it out of you. Uh-huh.